my video stopped. I'm here at Grand Rivers, here at the Tennessee Kentucky Lake, and I'm trying to tell my story halfway, halfway uh, remembering it right now. But whenever I got up there and I got to tromping around in the woods, I really didn't know nothing about these people's history towards what went on, how it went on, why it went on regarding the flood, regarding whenever they built this dam over here along about 19, 1933, something like that, basically almost 100 years ago now. I think they started it in like 28, maybe 27. They may have already hit their 100-year 100, 100 anniversary mark. But this was just basically a wild river right here. And in between this body of ground and that body of ground, there was all kinds of communities and roads and churches and buildings and, and businesses and etc. As a matter of fact, um, if I've got my boundaries right, on the other side of that point that I was talking to those gentlemen about that was fishing right there, on, if I've got my boundaries right, um, that point right there where you can see that bridge going into Aurora, Kentucky, which is probably at least 15 miles, maybe even further from here, there was a whole town called Birmingham just on the other side of that point. I'm thinking it was just on the other side of that point. And basically, they lost their whole town. And there was other smaller communities that were similar to towns. They may not have been incorporated at that time, but there was thousands and thousands of people's lives that got affected whenever they built this dam because they flooded all this and turned it into a great big lake, a huge lake that today some of your predominant property around here would probably go for a quarter million dollars for a five acre lot without a house on it if you had it close to the river now tva controls this river and controls everything beyond the boundaries of the river to a certain degree so if you do have a uh, waterfront property odds are tva is going to be in control of part of it if it ain't nothing but maybe um, maybe your boat dock or something that's down in the water. So it's kind of a hit and miss whenever it comes to them still being in control out here. But what really rattled these people, I mean rattled them, isn't, I mean it, it rattled them whenever they all had to move some of them went on that side of the of the river over towards Benton and uh, Aurora going back towards Calvert City basically going back towards Paducah, Kentucky and a lot of them stayed on the peninsula over here of course at that time they didn't even have it called Land Between the Lakes I think they called it something different but what really upset the apple cart was after they got through flooding this side of the peninsula, pertaining to the Tennessee River, there's another river on the other side. That's what makes it a peninsula. They flooded it too as well, pertaining to the Cumberland River, coming out of Clarksville, Tennessee, the town that I just come from. Up the road, give or take, probably, I'm going to say the way the crow flies from here, probably 50 miles. From here to Clarksville if you go straight in a line it's at least that I figure and of course Clarksville's right there at Fort Campbell but whenever they flooded that side of the river basically it done the exact same thing it run the people all out of the valleys towns communities settlements bridges roads the majority the way that I understand it of the churches that had cemeteries the majority of those cemeteries they dug up, they had enough respect for the people that they dug those graves up and moved them out of the area that was going to be flooded. Of course, 
there was so big of a span out here, there was no way that they could have got every grave. They just got basically the bigger cemeteries that they know was out here. Well, you figure this event over here on this side of the river happened in the 30s, early 30s. That really upset the apple cart. And then the other event, I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know this for a fact, probably happened around the era of World War II, maybe a little bit after World War II, pertaining to damming up that side of the water. It moved everybody inland again. And then later on, in 1963, Kennedy and, and Bobby Kennedy and, and JFK uh, flew over the property and decided that they was going to take it up for themselves and turn it into a wildlife refuge. And using various laws at that time, um, they could do it and do it legally because that's what the feds decided that they was going to do. Well, now you have displaced these people's lives not once, not twice, but three times. Three different times in the span of about two different generations. And it was so heartbreaking. After I got to analyzing and studying just exactly what had happened here, of knowing the, the great sacrifices that was made just for the progression of humanity so that people living in America could go into their homes and turn a light switch on and have lights. This was one of the uh, biggest developments at that time towards hybrid electricity that basically changed humanity. That's why God allowed for me to come up here and build a sacred site. And I went to praying and fasting and praying and fasting in 1989 over a sword symbolizing peace on earth that basically kicked off the beginning phases of the windmill ministry's missions. That basically my son and I went to New York City and Washington, D.C. on our first spiritual crusade in preaching the gospel and telling people about the word of God, warning and giving out advisories about what to expect, especially if those um, that took this nonchalantly of what was going to occur if they didn't listen. So this isn't something that I just picked up on yesterday or the day after yesterday or even last year or even five years this is something now that's been going on in my life that has consumed, invindated over half my life. I'm at the age of 63 now, and I've had multiple injuries growing up. And because of it, my old body's starting to wear out. And as of right now, I've got a $5,000 womb pump in the back of my backpack that stays turned on 24-7 that's constantly draining infection out of my leg that uh, I have to walk around and be married to this thing until we figure out whether or not it's going to work or not. As of today, it gave all the appearances that it was being effective towards shrinking the womb from the inside out which is a good thing because the tunneling in the womb wasn't near as deep and wasn't near as wide and of course we're more concerned about the inside of the womb than we are the outside of the womb and according to the doctors they've done taking one uh g uh i don't know if mra test and then they've done two ct cat scan test and according to all the testing I don't have no infection in the bone my infection is strictly a soft tissue infection 
which is a good thing because if it was a bone infection, we would be having to deal with this in a different way, in a different manner. I don't know for sure what that manner would be. I think it would have something to do with uh, uh, liquid um, IV that I'd have to go like three three times a week to try to fight off the infection that way because I've done already been on on um, antibiotics three different times this year and the last time that I was on antibiotics was 750 milligram taking them once a day for about five weeks and that didn't put a dent in it so these things occasionally happen in operations um, maybe it's the hardware maybe it's not sometimes like she talked this morning whenever whenever I talked to her that uh, sometimes just a pocket develops in in the leg itself that creates a womb and then infection sets up inside that womb and it just don't want to heal and there's been not hundreds but thousands of people if not millions that has went through similar operations especially the older that you are and with me being overweight and being a diabetic, diabetic too, it adds that much more seriousness to an operation that nobody pertaining to my doctor explained to me what the consequences was going to be if things didn't go according to plan. And I'm pretty sure he didn't mention that to me because he didn't want to deter me from me being one of his patients. While I was at Clarksville, Tennessee today, I got the report of the hospital bill on the first operation, which was basically $117,000. And then the report, the second report that they're still working on paying, which was uh, $54,000 for the hospital bill alone. That ain't the anesthesia bill. That ain't the doctor bill. But it, it, it's looking very close to right at a quarter of a million dollars is what this is going to wind up costing the insurance company because they're paying $150 a day for this machine that costs $5,000 plus the material that it uses, which is probably about probably about $100 every time we exchange the wounds, which is supposed to be done three times a week. So whenever it's all said and done with, this operation is going to cost a quarter of a million dollars. And hopefully, they'll be able to save my leg. As far as the actual fusion, uh, that done exactly like that was supposed to have done. Whenever they went in and removed all the arthritis and the gristle in between the ankle bone and the foot bone versus the leg bone, I still have probably 10, 12, maybe 15% movement in the left ankle or the left foot, the same as my right foot, um, which I can tell um, because my strength isn't like it should be in, in those areas with it being this close to the operation. It's probably going to take me a couple of years before I can learn to really coordinate and organize and stay balanced properly. Because it takes away from that flexibility. So this is just another a mountain or another hill that I'm having to climb towards fighting uh, this endless battle of basically the elements. And, and you can say whatever you want to say, but... Satan basically wanted to take me out towards me not being effective in the calling that I had in my life from God. And I really didn't realize how, how intense that this battle was going to be until after I come up here and done what i done and I had different um, spurts or uh, different... Um, bouts with the government that began with Homeland Security Secret Service and then it moved down to my own people in Tennessee attacking me then it moved up 
to this area towards these people attacking me. And then there was two or three other states that basically done the same thing, including the state of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, after I went down there and investigated them. They also put in a punch. So I've been whittled on, chewed on, by various demonic spirits working through various people that has tried desperately to destroy me. And it wasn't nothing personally that I've ever done to any of these people because I haven't never cheated them on a car deal. I didn't get fresh with none of their girlfriends or their wives. I didn't get out here and tell miscellaneous lies about them and, 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 and basically, uh, Tell a, tell a bunch of stuff on people that, that, that I shouldn't have been telling. But it was the spirit within them that hated the spirit from within me that they was trying desperately to ruin my life. In 207, and God, there was, I could write probably five or six, maybe ten books from from where I started at in 209, I mean from 1989, from 207, from all the events, the close encounters with laws and, and being evaluated and having this happen to me and that happen to me, I could probably write at least five different books uh, in addition to what went on up here from basically 207 up until about uh, 212 somewhere right in that area 214 uh, well it was 12 12 12 whenever I took my last shot from various people here in the state of Kentucky spending uh, almost a year in jail in Trigg County Kentucky which is down there where that I was showing you where those lights was uh, where that bridge is over there you see those lights right there that's where that newest bridge is going into Aurora, Kentucky. Once you go over the bridge into LBL, you'll drive maybe 12 miles of the peninsula. You'll go back over another river, which is the Cumberland River, and that area is called Craig County. That's Katie's, Kentucky. That was the last punch that they put in on me towards basically trying to had me institutionalized. That basically costed me almost a year in jail over two non-threatening telephone calls that there was no way in hell justified that type of punishment for anybody unless I was warned ahead of time that these obnoxious uh, obsession calls going to LBL, Land Between the Lakes, uh, was going to have to stop or the federal authorities was going to come down on me that way. Wasn't nothing never mentioned about no telephone calls until the last. Then they changed it in the process of stalking in the first degree to where now they, they downsized it to where it was an offense against Gary Hawkins and his wife, Lisa Hawkins, in which I haven't had no conversations at all with Lisa Hawkins, which was Gary Hawkins' wife that worked for the dispatch up here in Lamb Between the Lakes. And I've had a few conversations with Gary Hawkins, and by and large, I thought that me and Gary Hawkins was on the, on the right page. He had questioned me uh, more than once, about why that I was led to coming up here. And I truly believe because all the stuff that did already happen up here, because of so many people being paranoid, that once I showed myself as much as I did up here, because in total I've spent over well over a year living like Jeremiah Johnson on basically the wild. Um fasting and praying and praying for a revival and praying for peace and etc and um, once you expose yourself to a group of people that long 
they're going to get to wondering, why are you up here? What are you doing? What are you up to? What's led you up this way towards you doing all this? Because you're a Tennessean. Matter of fact, I even had one of the Kentucky State Troopers tell me one time, I don't know who it is, don't remember what his name is. Uh, he said, Mr. Jackson, if you're going to come up here and live up in Kentucky, you're going to have to abide by the Kentucky rules. And I looked at him, I said, I don't have no plans coming up here and living. I said, this is just an area that I come and visit. I'm not a, a, a pedestrian up here. I'm a, I, I thought I was a guest, a visitor, until what happened in my life in 207, whenever I'd done or been run completely out of Land Between the Lakes by uh, basically Dwayne Camry and his bunch that was working up here in LBO at the time, done, got run completely out of LBL and had to go back across the river and rent out a campsite pretty close to Aurora, Kentucky, probably less than five miles from Aurora, Kentucky, still on this body of water, but I was on the other side of the bank. And within, I don't know, I'd rented it out for about a month, 30 days. Um, within about a week, I went to Kinko's, and I God led me towards printing up a bunch of flyers and I started passing out flyers from Grand Rivers up to Benton, Kentucky, from Benton to Calvert City, from Calvert City on over towards Paducah, Kentucky. And whenever I got to Paducah, Kentucky, I was greeted by about 10 police officers that had guns on me telling me to get down on the highway, spread eagle, and had no earthly idea towards what was going on. Because all I was doing was trying to give out advisories and warnings to these people that God had showed me because of end time catastrophic prophesied events that there was going to be extremely uh, electrical disturbances in this area. Well, between point A and point B, which is probably give or take about, I'm thinking probably 35, 40 miles dropping off material at probably about 125 churches in which I was very, very persistent in what I was doing and how, how that I was doing it toward basically being a flim flam man. And if I wasn't putting out paper material, I was putting out cassette tapes. If I wasn't putting out cassette tapes, I was putting out VHS tapes. If I wasn't putting out VHS tapes, I was putting out CDs. In other words, I've been after it towards trying to help these people and warn them and tell them of things to come. But somebody had blowed my warnings or my advisories completely out of proportion. And instead of them looking at them towards them being a advisory or a warning, they actually took it upon towards it being a threat. That I was going to create an electrical disturbance by blowing up the Kentucky Dam. Now you keep in mind, I'm going to show you just a little bit of here right here you see where those blue lights are right there right there that's basically the northern end of the dam right at right at it anyway they built a levee all the way past those bigger lights right there which is basically the the headquarters of the dam where the electricity and all is stored and then from that area right there where you're looking at, on and on and on and on and on is concrete. And then you got levee, 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 levee going, I guess in total, from here to there is every bit of a mile. Maybe a mile and a half, two miles, I don't know. I ain't never measured it, but it's it's a good distance. And to think that anybody would even promote the ideal of an individual going to blow up a Kentucky dam. First of all, it's absolutely impossible. 
for one person to do something like that off of basically TNT, dynamite. You'd probably have to have, and I'm not kidding, you'd probably have to have a whole 18-wheeler full of nothing but dynamite before you would come close of cracking open that dam and really, really uh, causing internal uh, damage to the degree that the dam would actually give way. Because I guarantee you, four or five, ten boxes, even a hundred boxes of dynamite probably wouldn't phase it. Because that solid concrete over there that they built. Now, if a person had something hotter than TNT, I guess it could be done on a lesser scale. But I wasn't trying to harm or hurt these people. I was trying to help these people. Down below that dam is a lower area, give or take probably about maybe 60 foot, maybe 100 foot. And you got all kinds of villages down there, all kinds of communities down there that goes from here all the way to the Ohio River, all the way to the Mississippi River. And if that dam was to ever give way, it'd probably kill at least 10,000 people. At least. And if it didn't kill them, it would displace their lives to the degree that their lives would be over with anyways. If that dam ever cracked or or anything ever happened to that dam, it would affect that many people because it would basically go all the way to Paducah. But even parts of Paducah would flood if that dam ever gave way all, all at once. The point I'm trying to make is this. There was a consistency, consistencies of patterns in my life of people that was taking things that I was doing and blowing it out of proportion and instead of them putting me in the category towards somebody that was trying to help them, they was constantly trying to put me in the category of a monster of somebody that was trying to hurt them. And I could go on with testimonies, not just about the Kentucky Dam, but also about what went on in my personal life in Martin, Tennessee, in the same county that I live in to this day, in Weekly County, pertaining to the courts. I could go on of other different events, including the event in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and downtown Atlanta, about skirmishes. I'm talking about all out-and-out -out skirmishes with law enforcement to the degree that if they could have, they would have buried me uh, totally to the degree of me never walking or talking or being out into the eyes of the general public. And I don't know if people know much about the law and about safety concerns and et cetera, in which that's what I was taught all my life working on cars after I had my accident in 1979 was safety, 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 safety. That's all the insurance company preached. Every time you fixed a car, you had a safety meeting. Probably two or three of them a year. But um, the pattern of people wanting to destroy me was not and is not based upon misunderstandings. The pattern that had befallen up into my life towards people wanting to destroy me was an intentional one. An intentional pattern towards people lying about me, saying stuff that wasn't so, or taking words that I was talking to and taking it completely out of context. And instead of me trying to help these people, they was looking at it towards me trying to hurt these people. So whenever it comes to the, to the ballots that I've been through, one ballot after another ballot, kind of like a, a boxer in a boxing ring. This has been consistent in my life since 1989 of one 
skirmish after another. Rather not, it was a skirmish in Kentucky, skirmishes in Tennessee. And whenever I say skirmishes, there was more than just one skirmish up here in Kentucky. Whenever I talk about skirmishes, there was more than just one skirmish in Tennessee. I had skirmishes up in Washington, D.C. I had skirmishes over in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I had skirmishes in downtown Atlanta. And they was all associated with law. But what was even in a deeper detail is that 99.9% .9 of the people that was kicking up all the sand was the people that was going to churches that was supposed to have been Christians that was attacking me. So it was 100%, not 99, not 98, not 97, 100% in a spiritual context warfare towards these demons coming out of these people with these high positions uh, high ranking positions or or you know a minister that preaches uh, let's say to 2,000 people on Sunday or whatever maybe he's got satellite uh, ministry and maybe he, he, he can effectively reach out there and, and touch you know 10,000 maybe even 100,000 maybe a million well, those was the people that was rearing up about me. And those was the people that was kicking up all the sand. And what they was doing was trying to wear me down. Not one ballot, not two ballots, but in total, I'm going to say probably almost 20 or 25 but different ballots in some form or fashion, either on a local level, a state level, or a federal level. It was that many um, resistances that come up against me that wanted me to shut up. And as long as I was quiet, and as long as I didn't spread the word about the miracles that had happened in my life, and about how that God had showed me various things that was going to occur, to this planet, especially if humanity stayed on this stayed on this path that they was on, as long as I remained quiet about all that, they would have left me alone. But every time I stood my stood up and I let myself be known, that's whenever all hell busted loose in my life. Less than 10 days after Paducah, Kentucky had me apprehended later that night took me to Four Rivers Behavior Center in Mayfield, Kentucky and had me examined and the doctor said that I was fine go home y'all need to leave this man alone he ain't done nothing then I had to get my truck out of a pound but less than 10 days that same occurrence towards this same dam happened again. And this time it was even more intense because it was two TVI agents, uh, two officers that, that from the Sheriff's Department that come out of Murray, Kentucky, a FBI agent, a supervisor and somebody else drove into the middle of the woods while I was camping by myself in a tent probably give or take about 11, 12 o'clock at night maybe, maybe 10, I don't know but it was night that basically interrogated me for at least two and a half to three hours while I was being ate up by mosquitoes wanting to know if I had any intentions towards wanting to blow up this dam. Now you figure where those light, blue lights right there are, you go all the way down and you keep going and going and going and going and going. What they was wanting, they was wanting me to say that I had harmful intentions and owning up to something 
that they wanted me to own up to, which would have been nothing more than a mere lie. Just like whenever the event happened in my life in 1991 in Wheeling, West Virginia, those doctors that I was being evaluated by in Butner, North Carolina, wanted me to own up and say, well, just go ahead and admit, Mr. Jackson, you had harsh intentions towards Mr. George Walter H. Bush, and you was actually on your way to Washington, D.C. to try to do bodily harm to him. And the answer to that question was no, no, a thousand times no. I was on my way to Washington, D.C. to try to warn those people that they had went to war with the Wong people pertaining to Desert Storm and Desert Shield that wound up getting us in the trouble that we're in right now that began in, not, that began, uh, in 9-11, 9-1-1. A matter of fact, the flags in the state of Kentucky are still flying half-staff because it was about a week ago whenever we memorialized those people, which was give or take around 3,000 people that died during 9-11. The people in the state of Kentucky has a very, very sensitive heart whenever it comes to dropping the American flag. And I've seen them do it more so than Tennessee, even if it wasn't about maybe not just a congressman or a senator dying or somebody close like that in, in, the, in the system, but even if there was a terrible, terrible accident and there was four or five soldiers that got killed or whatever, the state of Kentucky, they are very sensitive whenever it comes to dropping that flag. And like I said, on the way up here, getting off the main interstate, that was one of the first things I took notice of, that the flag in the state of Kentucky is still down. Recognizing, memorializing what had went on in 9-11. To have something like that occur in one's life, not once, but twice is not only extremely unusual, but it's horrifying. And the sad thing about this horrifying experiences that I've went through, it didn't just happen in Kentucky. It happened in my home area that I was raised up in going all the way back to 1983 whenever I was attacked by a vicious human being at the time because I still had 64 staples up and down my belly after me losing nine units of blood and almost dying. I go to the authorities and try to get help. And instead of getting help, I got hurt. Just like me passing out Bible literature in Martin, Tennessee in 2005, telling people, about the message coming from God, coming from the Bible. Trying to help people. But the weekly county authorities, along with the judges and everybody else, wanted to turn it around to act as if that I was wanting to hurt people rather than help people. I have never in my entire life seen a group of people in America, and I know it's not everybody, but the people that I have had encounters with, I have never seen a group of people that was so dead set that they wanted to bring destruction into their own lives. And that they were so dead set that they wasn't going to listen to this individual. They'd rather listen to a, a, a two-faced uh, fake preacher that would lie to them and keep them convinced that what that they was doing was totally all right with God. And in the meantime, they were steadily digging a hole. And they was digging a hole not just for themselves, but digging a hole for all of us. And it has taken this type of abuse again and again and again, towards me basically standing up 
getting slapped around, playing dead man's bluff, quieting down, you know, digging in, hunkering down, and then after the coast was clear, stand back up and do it again. May have been in West Tennessee, may have been in Washington, D.C., may have been in Kentucky, it may have been in Oklahoma, but I had to do this simultaneously. Just like a boxer going into a ring of having ballots. A boxing ring. Round one. Round two. Round three. Round four. And in the meantime, I'm taking on not one-on-one, -on -one, but usually it's like seven, eight, ten, twenty, 30, I guess the group of people that I was dealing with in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma at the time, whenever I was out there in 2009, was probably as much as 100 individuals that was coming at me, trying to promote me as me being another Timothy McVeigh, simply because I was out there snooping around, finding out that there had to have been more to the, to the, to the Oklahoma bombing other than a rider truck with about three or 4,000 pounds of ammonia nitrate in it. And I did. I got down to the bottom of it. But by doing so, they marked me even that much more deeper. Rather than giving me a medal or congratulating me because I did find out the truth, the whole truth, that the, that the federal authorities was lying to their own, to their own people, rather than be patted on the back, I got shoved out the door. I, I got thrown under the bus. Again and again and again. Now, I've made mention before in some of my other work because I know that there are certain people that are analyzing every word that I say. They're trying to read me. They're trying to profile me. They're trying to figure me out. Well, you know, those same people, 2,000 years later, are still trying to figure out Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ's motives and how in the world did Jesus Christ know what was going to occur during the time that it occurred. you got people to this day that are still as, as far away from actually understanding the intent of, of why Jesus done what Jesus done during the time that he done it that is just as far from daylight is dark. Now they'll tell you in their own un mental understanding that they understand why Jesus done what he done. But deep down inside, that would be like me saying, well, I can relate to a woman that's had children even though I've never had a child. I can tell her that I've, I can relate to her having a child, but you know as well as I do, by me making such of a statement, I would be lying to her. Because in all practicality, there's no way for a human male to relate to a female that's already had a baby. A matter of fact, that goes just as, just as far over to other females that has never had children, they can say, well, we understand and we can relate. But deep down inside, really and truly, they can't even relate because they've never had a child. They've never had that experience. I think you get my drift in what I'm trying to say here, that there's so many people that has tried to decipher the Word of God with their own mind and with their own understanding. And the Bible wasn't meant to understand with the mind, but understand with the, with the soul. Understand with the Spirit, to let the Spirit guide you and direct you in how to decipher the Bible. Because there's different seasons in the Bible that meant different things, even though 200 years ago, our ancestors may have interpreted various scriptures out of the Bible that today we don't even come close to interpreting the, the way that they did. 
Does that mean that they was wrong and were right? No. They was right, and so were we. And you may be saying, well, how can that be? Well, it's based upon the season, and it's based upon the knowledge, the wisdom, and the era that we're living in. And the era are different eras um, produce different people of doing different things, of interpreting the Bible. And then there's other eras that basically come to naught, just like the Bible talks about, that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, whenever you're trying to give these people knowledge and they're steadily biting you in the back and stabbing you in the back and bringing up all kinds of, of lies about you, you finally get the message, well, you know what, God, I've done all that I can do. I've done my part. And you've heard me say this before. Dennis James Jackson has not failed the windmill ministry's missions. But rather, it was the public that failed Dennis Jackson. And that's exactly what they wanted. They wanted Dennis James Jackson to fail. Because, spiritually speaking, in which, subconsciously, they didn't even know this themselves. You keep in mind, the brain has two different elements of consciousness and unconsciousness, or subconsciousness. And a lot of times people say things and do things that they don't even realize why they, why they said it or why they've done it. And they'll think later, they'll say, why in the world did I say that? Why in the world did I do that? It was because you wasn't putting everything together in your mind. And you was trying to figure something out in your mind whenever you should have been trying to figure it out in your soul, in your spirit. That's the only way to truly interpret the Bible in whatever era or season that we're in. Because the Bible says that there's a season for planting, there's a season for harvesting, there's a season for peace, there's a season for war, there's a season for this, there's a season for that. And God is the one that develops those seasons based upon our generation or our era that we're living in. In other words, to whom much is given, much is required. Those people 200 years ago didn't know as much as we know today. So whenever they read various scriptures, they got the meaning out of that verse that they needed to get at that time to help them along with their walk with God, with their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, our knowledge has expanded. Even the book of Daniel tells us that that was going to occur, which is another prophecy that is coming true. And because our knowledge has expanded, we look at various scriptures a little bit differently. Not all of the verses, but some of the verses we look at a little differently than what our ancestors did going back 150, 200 years ago. So can you only imagine whenever they was introduced to the Bible, in which the majority of the world hadn't been introduced to the Bible uh, before probably the 15th century. It was only in the 15th century whenever the Bible started being introduced on a global scale to the world. But up until then, whenever people did read the Bible or know anything about the teachings of Jesus Christ, they looked at it towards it being a foreign substance, a foreign entity. Because up until then, they had been taught the original Judaism law that come from Moses, which was a branch off to an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So whenever Jesus come onto the scene 2,000 years ago, after these people had been brainwashed by believing all that, whenever this guy stepped onto the, to the stage and started telling them about love, and turn thy cheek and offer thy other. And, and love thy enemy. 
They could not figure this guy out. They thought this guy was totally insane. Or they thought that he was of a devil. Because they was not going to spend time in trying to figure out the sincerity of his message. And because of it, I'm sure a lot of those people died that are now separated from God in hell. Because they refused to acknowledge the truth coming from one of the main messengers. And whenever you get to looking at Moses, Moses was basically a messenger. Moses was a liberator. Whenever you get to looking at Noah, Noah was basically a messenger. He was a communicator. But the people didn't want to listen to Noah. And Noah finally reached a pinnacle point in his life, similar to mine, that, you know what? I, I can't do nothing else. Uh, I've gone as far as I can go with this, God. Best thing for me to do is just shut my mouth and go back over there with my sons and my wife and start beating and banging nails. That way we can get this thing built and we can go ahead and get this thing over with. That's exactly what Noah done. Because Noah knew at that point in time that he was basically just throwing his pearls out to the swine. He was trying to help those people. He was trying to give them advisories and warnings and telling them that if they continued on this path that they was on, it was going to bring total destruction into their lives. But rather than listening to him, they ignored him. We can look where God has anointed other prophets of God, male and female, mostly male, but there's been females. Ruth was one of them that was gifted of God. Uh, Mary was gifted of God. There was lots of women in the Bible that was gifted of God that had a divine message. And, you know, some of them listened to them and some of them didn't. Matter of fact, most of them didn't. Matter of fact, most of them would go away shaking their head, thinking, why would that person have ever said that? Why would that person have ever thought that way? Well, because that's the way that God made us. And we're supposed to be a helpmaker or my brother's keeper while we're here towards helping each other and not hurting each other. Especially when somebody is trying to help you and now you have misjudged that person and you're taking everything that that person is trying to do out of context and now you're trying to put that person you have stereotyped that person to the degree that you rather look down at that person than to look at that person either as an equal and trying to help you towards being a good person which is a relation to what Jesus taught that the reason why humanity in and of itself hates light is because humanity, sinners love sin. Sinners love sin. They rather walk away from the righteousness of God pertaining to the light because they're more in love with darkness. Like I said, this is Grand Rivers, Kentucky. I'm up here right now at the Tennessee River that they have turned into a Kentucky Lake that they now call the Kentucky Lake because there's houses up and down this river, uh, not by the dozens, not by the hundreds, but by the thousands. And some of these people has really, really nice property. And then again, some of these people may not have nothing but a a RV that they're living in, a, a hut or whatever. But it's really went a long way since basically whenever they first spade, the first spade out here towards having an ideal that they was going to dam up this, this body of water in which sometimes the river was so out of control, sometimes you could actually walk across the Tennessee River. In the dead summertime, they was having a major drought. You could walk across it knee high. 
while other times it would be raging and it would just wash families and communities down the river and kill them. And it wasn't until basically the 1900s whenever the Corps of Engineers and other people got to, got to you know, figuring out these things about low-lying areas and where we needed to build and where we didn't need to build and what was going on with various waterways. It wasn't until then that they figured out, hey, this is what we ought to do. All right. So this move was a good move. Even though it breaks all the traditions pertaining to the Native American uh, teachings of the history of the Indian people. By and large, this was a good move because it did progress humanity on a different level. The same way as damming up the Cumberland River and putting hydro dams on, on that body of water and basically turn that body of water into the same thing that they turned this body of water into. Which was really almost like a genesis. It was almost like creating something that really and truly only God was supposed to create. So mankind has stepped into the future in doing marvelous, magnificent things. But whenever the Kennedys flew over this piece of property and decided on the third time that they was going to kick every human being off of it just for the pure aggravation of doing it, that's whenever they stepped over the line. And I personally believe, I can't prove it, it's a theory, but I personally believe that the Kennedy assassination had everything in the world to do with after, after he flew over this body of ground in 1993, it was shortly after that that he was dead. Of course, they were stirring up trouble in his country all over that I didn't even know nothing about until after I got to studying about what actually occurred with the Kennedys. Matter of fact, in this town right now, that's now an incorporated town that wasn't an incorporated town like it is now in 1989 whenever I first got acquainted with various people in this area, this settlement. Somebody, I don't know if it was a cousin, I don't know if it was JFK himself, I don't know if it was an uncle, I don't know who it was, but bought a piece of property within a mile from here that the Kennedys had their name all over it. So you tell me what was going on in, in the Kennedy's mind whenever they come over here and they looked at this big body of water and this mass peninsula and they said, hmm, wouldn't this be nice just to take it from the people and let the government control it any way that the government wanted to control it. And to this day, I still have bad feelings that TVA could do to this body of ground up here, even though it's hundreds and thousands of acres more, basically the same thing that they've done in, in the uh, north part of Mississippi, going down around Pickwick, um, Pickwick Dam, in the lower part of Tennessee, that there was a body of ground over there that TVA was in control of, and they basically released their authority to it and turned it back over to the public. And it become prominent ground for anybody to build on and live on. In other words, it become part of, part of their cash cow up in that area. And who's to say that somebody didn't put a pencil to this and say, well, if we run everybody off and after basically four or five generations die, that way we won't have to worry about a bunch of resistance coming from the nieces and the nephews and the cousins and the brothers of the sisters and the and family members that went back into that era that if we'll let enough of them die out, eventually we can do the same thing and we can turn... L-B-L 
into a golden cash cow for Western Kentucky. Who's to say that their whole intentions wasn't that whenever they flew over this piece of property and said, you know what? We're going to, we're going to, we're going to do what we want to do to this, regardless of how many lies that we're going to destroy in doing it, we're still going to do it anyway. Well, that costed this government a president, as far as I'm concerned. And from then on, America started giving the farm away, basically started walking backwards. And I think that our politicians become very lame. I don't know if it was because of fear. I don't know if it was because they realized that they wasn't as strong or as invincible as what they originally thought that they was up until the assassination of Kennedy. And of course, they went through other periods, this government with um, social unrest, with other movements that happened. And to be quite honest with you, I'm afraid right now um, for a particular person that he has created an environment though his intentions may be good in trying to save and spare America but I'm just afraid I actually fear for this man's life that he has stirred up such of a bees hive a hornet's nest in what that he's trying to achieve that now he's put a target on his back and because of it they're out to get him and because of it it's going to make Homeland Security Secret Service's job about a hundred times harder in trying to make sure that a catastrophe does not hit because if a catastrophe was to hit in the level of an assassination of a president, which I hope to God that that don't happen, I'm pretty sure that the rioting and the craziness that we have seen with other groups of people like George Floyd or other innocent people's lives that has been killed by various dirty cops or whatever, I'm pretty sure that we would see a level of violence in this land that would exceed the civil rights movement probably a hundred plus fold more. You keep in mind that just about everybody and their brother in this country has one or two or three or ten or a hundred guns depending upon who they are. They've done drugs. All their parents was on drugs. They don't think logically. They don't have no fear of God. They don't have no fear of the government. And because of it, you basically got a festering sore right now that's getting bigger and worser every day pertaining to Donald J. Trump. And like I said, it bothers me. It really does. It bothers me all the way to my very soul in seeing what Donald is trying to do, but understanding how deceived and how wicked that humanity over here has become. And of course, society... If you study society pertaining to history, they've always had to have somebody to blame other than themselves. Regardless whether it was this person or that person or this group or that country, they always want to blame somebody else for their own inadequacies. And it all boils down to whenever God created Adam and Eve and then God comes back and realizes that Eve and Adam had done something that they wasn't supposed to have done. 
And whenever God questioned Eve, rather than her admitting, well, God, it was my fault. I gave in to the temptations of the devil. She blamed it on the snake, on the serpent. The serpent made me do it. And then whenever God turns and he confronts Adam, Adam's reply was, it was the woman that you gave me that caused me to do it. Passing the buck to somebody else or to someone else or to something else. Rather than being a man or a woman about it and admitting your faults. Now there's no doubt. If you're looking for somebody that can walk on water, turn water into wine and raise dead, you may as well keep going, blowing and going somewhere else because I, I'm not capable of doing those things. Or I'm not capable yet of doing those things. I'm pretty sure that if I live long enough, strong enough, and the Lord blesses me with those talents, that maybe one day I would have the qualifications of doing that. But once more, it wouldn't be me that would be doing that. It would be the spirit within me that would be doing that. I myself cannot do nothing. I myself basically is, is as useless as one of them boulder rocks down there next to the water. Because we was all made from basically the ground. God breathed life into the nostrils that created Adam. So we're basically all part of this earth. We was earthly founded. And because of it, we have a sinful nature. I just would like for those that have heard about me, that knows anything about me, would try to look at this from a different angle towards the effort that I have put forth again and again and again, year after year after year. And to see this great nation and to see this planet in the shape that it's in right now is one of the most distressing, heartbreaking, horrifying event that I could ever begin to imagine because I've tried and tried and tried to help and it seems like the more that I try to help, the worse it gets. I just pray that Donald will be protected by the hand of God, regardless whether it be with this Homeland Security. Our Homeland Security may actually have to um, merge with the military, United States military, in making sure that these candidates... Not just Donald's life, but anybody else out there that's trying to put themselves out on the front line. I just pray that the devil will not win and that God and that God's people will win. And I'm going to continue to believe, even though I'm 63 years old, and even though I've went through the hell that I've went through, not only physically, but emotionally, psychologically, and every other kind of way, that the meek is going to inherit this earth, just as the Bible talks about, and that we will see that great revival, as God talked about in the book of Acts, towards him coming down in such of a divine way, that his Holy Spirit would brush over this great land and heal not just our nation, but this planet. I'm going to continue to keep believing that. And I know a lot of people are laughing and, man, they're, they're jumping up and down and they're hee-hawing and they're saying, what a idiot, what a stupid you-know-what, what a this, what a that. Well, you know what? I got my right that I can believe whatever I want to believe. And I put forth, I think, my best foot in effort for the past 
30 plus years and trying to tell people about these occurrences. So one day whenever I stand in front of my Lord and my Savior, and God's going to look at me and say, how come you didn't use every ounce of energy that I gave you and every tool that was available to you, how come you did not try to get your message out to the people that I desired for you to put out there to the people? And I'm going to look at God and I'm going to say, God, I did. And I feel like that God's going to look back at me and say, yes, son, you did. You went through skirmish after skirmish after skirmish. And now at the age of 63, having a machine tied to your back that's costing the insurance company $150 a day to rent, but basically over $5,000 to try to correct a problem that was created in my life at the age of 19 towards falling off a four-story building that even though I may be crippled, even though I may be old, even though I've been whipped up on, bruised, and taken advantage of, I'm still ready to fight the strongest demonic demon out there. And I'm not afraid to stand on that front line the same as others that have stood on that front line before me to say, you know what? I don't care what may come my way. I'm not going to compromise on that in which what God has given me to do. So in that sense, I do look up to Donald J. Trump, even though, even though, I'm going to put this in there on a the sideline, even though it was Donald J. Trump that was bold enough, galled enough, to basically stir this pot up the way that he has. And who's to say that this is the only way that it's going to, to take to basically heal this great nation? It's for somebody like Donald J. Trump or somebody like Dennis James Jackson that can tell people the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and isn't persuaded by some group isn't persuaded by some um, some committee or some government, but will tell the truth according to the knowledge that God had given me to tell. Who's to say, even at the brink of possibly a civil war, that this is what it's going to take to realign America towards America being not what I wanted to be, not what others wanted to be, but what God wanted it to be. Because this great nation was blessed by God and this great nation can be cursed by God. God made it. He can destroy it. He used that in an illustration of the Bible pertaining to the workers because the workers started complaining and saying, well, how come you're giving them the same amount of money and we worked during the heat of the day and they only started working about 3 o'clock in the afternoon and now you're giving them the same amount of money? And God looked at them and said, is it not mine that I can do what I wish to do? And it is. This is God's. This whole thing belongs to God. And if you're a children of God, it belongs to you too as well. If you'll stand up and announce it to the world that we don't have to take this demonic bulliness 
and people running us over and telling us how to run our lives and what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. This planet belongs to God. Satan may be in charge of it right now, towards him being the prince of it. But one day, his authority will cease to exist. And the ownership, the true ownership, will go back into the hands of him that created it, even if he has to destroy it, to recreate it again, he will have his way. God will have his way. No matter whether or not I like it, support it, don't like it, whether or not I hate it, God will have his way. My advice would be to strongly do the right thing. As I have said before and I'll say again, no, God cannot make people serve him. He cannot make people be loyal to him. But what he can do and what he will do, and he'll do this out of love, not out of vengeance, not out of greed, not out of selfishness, but what he will do is make us regret that we didn't be obedient and that we didn't serve him and that we wasn't loyal to him towards being what he wanted us to be and not what we wanted ourselves to be. And I know that's a mouthful. I know it is. But it's the truth. And the truth will set you free. It's a lot there to take in. So, to answer my question, it looks like 1921 was just about the time that this thing got kicked off. So from that, it's telling me that they basically hit their, hit their benchmark of 100 years. That's what I'm thinking. If I'm reading that right. Of course, it didn't just come right out and say that, pertaining to the leadership of the TBA, where Congress basically handed them a blank check and told them to go do whatever it took to turn an uncivilized society into a civilized society. But this is the dream. This is the genesis. After a hundred years, this is what got developed. And you have to admire that in and of itself in the strength of humanity and having the faith that they could pull this off. Because we are supposed to be good stewards to this planet. And out of this development, I personally believe that it has created more good than created bad. Like I said, the true Native American Indian may look at this in a different perspective toward trying to modernize this great planet. And in some ways, they're right. Humanity has went way too far with the pollution, with the stagnation, cutting down the trees, doing things that we shouldn't be doing either to ourselves or to the planet. But hopefully, in a way out, and hopefully, the good benefits will outweigh the bad. Thanks for listening. I know I'm kind of bored at sometimes whenever I talk about my life and the things that's went on in my life. But what I talk about is the truth. I don't. I don't try to live in some fantasy land and I really didn't think about this until 
whenever I pull it up here, towards what type of adventurous lifestyle that I have actually lived. I didn't realize the things, so many things that I've been involved in throughout my life, going to so many different places, going to so many different states, being involved with so many different people's lives, I really didn't realize of how adventurous, like a Tom Sawyer's or something, that I've actually been until just now. Year 2024, after September the 11th. Now look at that boat right there going. Man, he's moving, he's trucking. Watch him right there. See him? He's probably doing about 80, maybe 90. Watch him right there. Heck, he looks like he may be going over 100. He is trucking. Of course, with the water being calm like it is right now, that's the time that you can, you can move on that water because it's just like a piece of glass. Where in the daytime, whenever the wind's blowing, all the other boats is making it. He's going, he going over 100 mile an hour. He is absolutely moving. Look at that. Who knows, he probably does that all the time. Probably going back to his little, little cottage somewhere. Kind of a cottage or home somewhere. That's one of the good things about the river life. You just don't depend upon the highway. You can get from point A to point B and this neighbor over here can go visit this neighbor over here, just like if he was driving a car but do it in about three times less the amount of time on the water, especially if you got a boat like that. Thanks for listening. God bless America. And God bless our endeavors towards where we go, how we go, when we go, and hopefully, no matter what, that God, the Eternal Father, will go with us. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your prayers. God bless our military. God bless our country. And shalom.